Hi guys, this is Dr. Mahindra Nj, your Forensic Medicine and Toxicology faculty from Meru. Here we're going to have a small discussion on NEET PG 2023 recall questions from the subject Forensic Medicine and Toxicology. If you look at the questions in this session, all the questions were straight uh, forward questions. There is uh, no kind of twisting everything. It's very easy questions. I hope all of you must have gotten a great strike rate. And all the questions were basically from the high yield areas. Like normally you tend to have uh, areas like uh, management of snake bite, management of datura poisoning, and you have autopsy technique. These are all the areas where we tend to get the questions often. And the same trend has been followed this year as well. Okay, right. Let's start with the uh, first question. The method of autopsy carried out en masse, right? They've given you the clue itself, en masse to remove from the tongue to prostrate. So this is Letiul's technique, very easy question. Fine. And you know very well there are four techniques of organ removal we have got. Number one, we can remove the organs one by one, wherein all the attachments will be severed, all the attachments will be cut, right? You can study the organ in detail, but you cannot study the inter-organ relationship. In that case, if you want to study the inter-organ relationship, right? In that case, you can remove all the organs together. That is called en mass, where you take the, all the organs together, detaching the tongue, from the attachment and remove the cervicothoracic organs, abdominal organs, pelvic organs together as a single mass. We call it as N mass. And the third method that is we have got block dissection. One of the disadvantages of N mass is so it's, it gives you such a large mass. Sometimes it's very difficult to handle. So if you want to reduce the size of the mass, then you can have this block dissection where specifically you focus on cervicothoracic, abdominal or urogenital block. You call it as Gons method. Right. And the last one is in situ method where you dissect inside the body itself. This is preferred in a case where you don't want the external contamination. Right. We'll discuss about that. The first technique organ by organ that is called virtuous technique. This happens to be the most common technique because it's easy one. Right. But when you remove all the organs together, that is called Letiul's technique. You can remember L for large mass. N mass is the technique where it gives you large mass. You can remember Letiul's large mass. As I told you earlier, if you want to study the anatomical relationship, the architecture is preserved only in Letiul's. So you can prefer this particular technique for the study of anatomical relationship. Fine. And similarly, we have the Gons method that is block dissection. This is Gons method. As I told you, cervical, thoracic, abdominal or urogenital blocks can be obtained. And from there, you can start doing dissection. And then the last method is in situ method inside the body. We call this as Rokitansky method. This is done inside the body. Preferably, it is useful in case of infectious disease. For example, the person suffers from COVID, the person dies of HIV, where if you remove the organs out, there can be spillage of the body fluid, there can be a chance of contamination. So what you do is you dissect the organ inside the body itself, in situ dissection, com sometimes combined with the block dissection. That's called Rokitansky method, right? We know the name, Virtuos, Letius, Gons and Rokitansky. Fine. And the answer was uh, Letius method. Right, N mass. The next question is also from the same area. It becomes so simpler for you. A 42 year old HIV positive patient died and the body was brought for post mortem. The method of autopsy to be done is dash. We just now we discussed it is Rokitansky method. It's quite very simple for you. The temperature of a body of a diseased person is raised to 39 degrees Celsius. What is the reason? Right, is it cyanide poisoning, corrosive poisoning, septicemia, or intra abdominal hemorrhage? The first thing what they have given you is you need to find out the condition, right, where the body temperatures increase after death, right? That is what they've given you. The body temperature of a deceased person is raised to 39 degrees Celsius. Forget about the 39 degrees, the number. You just remember it is a body, it is a con condition where the body temperature is raised. See, normally what happens, normally what happens if uh, the person dies, there is a decrease in the there is a decrease in the body core temperature, right? There is a decrease in the body core temperature and the body keeps on cooling down, fine? So this is called this is called as algomotus, fine? So this is called as algomotus, but sometimes what happens, there can be, there can be increase in the body temperature. The body remains warm. The body remains warm, right? After death, even after death, the body remains warm, not for a longer time, maybe for one to two hours. What is this condition, guys? This is basically called as, this is basically called as post-mortem caloricity, PM caloricity, right? Now, in what kind of situations that you can expect this post-mortem caloricity? Whenever there is disrupted or impaired 
whenever there is impaired heat regulation in the body at the time of death at the time of death impaired heat regulation or there can be excessive heat production in the body at the time of death or there can be excessive bacterial activity right in the body bacterial activity in the body then you can see postmortem calericity fine i have given you the concept i have given you the mechanism you can find out what are the conditions that are associated with this the first condition is where impaired heat regulation maybe you can remember heat stroke heat stroke increase heat production in the body you can remember the heat is produced in the body in a case of tetanus or strychnos nux vomica particularly when the person is suffering from convulsions at the time of death you can see there is excessive heat gener convulsions muscle convulsions increase heat generation resulting in post mortem caloricity and the third important one is increase bacterial activity you can remember any uh, disease like for example septicemia or you can say cholera these are the situations where you can expect there is increase heat production i mean increase bacterial activity resulting in post mortem caloricity i think the option is very straight forward safety semia you don't get you don't get post mortem calcite in a case of cyanide poisoning corrosive poisoning intraoperative hemorrhage the answer is very straight forward that is safety semia for that you, for you to answer this question you must have understood about the mechanism of post mortem calcite i've just given you the mechanism right just do right remember about that a child before playing right consumed a fruit from a garden the child was fine but in some time of playing the child had got high fever the child was confused photophobia was there decreased salivation was there what is the probable causative agent and the possible antidote right you can see four options were given the main uh, uh, options were datura and yellow volan that is the option that you need to eliminate you can see first of all you can just look at the condition right the person uh, the child was eating a fruit the child was eating a fruit and the child was having a high fever the child was confused photophobia is there decreased salivation is there that is again one of the important keyword high fever is also another important keyword what is the possible causative agent the answer is datura and the antidote that can be given for this is physostigmin right yellow oleander yellow oleander can be eliminated because there is no mention about the cardiac arrhythmia because you know very well yellow oleander is a cardiac poison the person should be presenting with the cardiac arrhythmia and there is no mention of uh, mention about the hyperkalemia and electrolyte disturbances so you can easily rule out yellow oleander and here you can see the person is having the patient is having high fever not only having high fever dried secretions decreased salivation which is so typical for your datura poisoning right datura poisoning is again one of the commonly asked question in your examination right you should never make mistake on datura poisoning right datura you know what are the active principle the active principle of datura is hyoscin right and atropine so basically they are basically they are anticholinergic right so you know all the eight days all the dried secretions dry mouth dry skin dilatation of pupil dysarthria dysphagia everything is there but if you want to remember properly you can just remember just 3d that is sufficient number one remember it causes delirium datura belongs to a delirient poison number one number two it causes dried secretions you can see dry mouth dry skin right everything and remember it also causes dilated pupil dilatation of pupil fine so if you find everything then definitely it should be a datura poisoning and the antidote that we have to give is physostigmin you can see the patient was they confused right the patient was having dried secretions the patient was having dilated pupil photophobia is given so all the classical symptoms has been given right and when we talk about yellow oleander yellow oleander you know it is uh, basically a cardiac person yellow oleander what we have to know is the scientific name of yellow oleander is cerbera tevesia remember it is cerbera tevesia that is the scientific name of yellow oleander what is the active principle of this yellow oleander you can remember there are lot of cardiac glycosides lot of cardiac glycosides which act very similar to digitalis right you can see we have got uh, nerifolin we have got tevitin we have got tevitoxin tevitoxin we have got ruocyte we have got peruocyte all these are the active principles of yellow oleander 
right all these are the active principles of yellow oleander as the name implies the patient will be having cardiac arrhythmia but if you see two typical uh, electrolyte abnormalities can be noted here one is hyperkalemia hypokalemia can also be noted but hyperkalemia is life threatening not only that even hypomagnesemia can also be noted in this poisoning right so keep a note of this guys so if you find any uh, question with this kind of patient uh, has consumed unknown fruit right and the flower was looking uh, bell shaped the person suffers from chest pain palpitation and uh, admitted to the hospital the potassium level is elevated right you you got the answer that is your yellow oleander fine and of course the patient will be having cardiac arrhythmia i told you how do you manage this condition you need to manage the condition right first you have to do decontamination remember decontamination has to be done as with any other poison and you need to control the arrhythmias anti arrhythmic measures to be taken and remember the patient has got hyperkalemia you need to correct the potassium level you should also correct the magnesium level potassium level the best way to correct the potassium level is giving a, a dextrose insulin dextrose infusion so that is the best way to correct this hyperkalemia right so these are all the things that you have to note with regard to yellow oleander i'll show you the datura so this is the datura fruit you can see thorn apple this is thorn apple a solitary fruit remember sometime you may get uh, similar fruit that comes in cluster smaller fruit that is not dathura that is castor seed castor thrissinus fruit right so you should not get confused if you see a solitary fruit larger with multiple thorns on it remember it is dathura and you can see a beautiful uh, white uh, flower of dathura right they call it as angel's trumpet okay or devil's trumpet you can see this is the uh, oleander fine yellow oleander you also have uh, pink oleander that is nerium odorum fine a man develops seizures at normal consciousness in between this is highly suggestive right this is the important keyword that you have to take fine he had multiple such episodes was taken herbal medicines for the same during the episodes he had arching of his back what is the likely toxin is it strychnine is it ricinus nerium odorum or abrus precatorius or datura whatever right so the answer is remember when a patient has got multiple seizures right you see let us eliminate all the other remaining poisons it cannot be ricinus because ricinus comes as a plant irritant mostly it presents with irritant features the patient might be suppose the patient has consumed it the person must be presenting with abdominal pain vomiting diarrhea so that can be ruled out easily nerium odorum nerium odorum is a cardiac person there is no mention about any cardiac disease and datura we know what are the typical features so it cannot be datura and obviously abrus is also a plant irritant that cannot be a plant irritant poisoning right now coming to the only one option that is strychnos nuxvamica let us look at the features of strychnos nuxvamica then it will become so easy for us you can see strychnos nuxvamica the common name is kuchila plant and you have got kuchila seed this is your kuchila seed you can see an rbc shape shape seed right it's like a button right called as kuchila seed remember one crushed seed can be fatal one crushed seed can be fatal intact seeds are not poisonous that is what we need to understand intact seed is not poisonous whereas crushed seed are poisonous what is the most important active principle the most important active principle is bls basic life support what is that we have got brucin right we have got loganin and last but not least that is your strychnine strychnine again very important fine so you have got brucin loganin strychnine very very important what is the action of strychnine strychnine acts on the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord you know that it's a spinal poison so it acts on the anterior horn cell where it inhibits glycine when it is in inhibiting glycine the inhibition is lost see normally glycine is a inhibitor neurotransmitter in the spinal cord so when the inhibitor neurotransmitter is inhibited the anterior horn cells get excited we call it as release excitation right release excitation the anterior horn cell gets excited it gets excited resulting in muscle convulsions the patient will present with muscle convulsions right muscle convulsions look at the feature of muscle convulsion that is again important if you look at the feature of muscle convulsions you can say this is an episode of convulsions followed by a period of relaxation right again there is an episode of convulsion followed by relaxation again there is an episode of convulsions resulting in death of the person you can see what you can notice is this tonic clonic convulsions you can see that here the muscle is convulsion in between the convulsion the muscle is relaxed 
right you can also note that with every passing phase of convulsions the duration of relaxation keeps on coming down right it keeps on decreasing finally the two episodes of convulsions may merge and the person will die another important point is in between this period the muscle is becoming relaxed and during the period the person consciousness is there the person is absolutely conscious consciousness is not impaired and you can also note that there is no history of injury right otherwise we could have thought about tetanus fine there is no history of injury and in tetanus specifically there is in between the phase there in between the phase of uh, convulsion there is no relaxation phase at all there is no relaxation phase right you can easily rule out tetanus and you will have three type of tonus the first important tonus is this backward bending of the spine backward arching of the spine it is so typical that is ophistho tonus right ophistho tonus hyper extension of the spine most common tonus sometimes you may get temporostal tonus that is your forward bend this is ophistho tonus this is temporostal tonus and the sideward bending is your lateral flexion is your pleurostal tonus right this happens to be the most common tonus there is one important finding that you have to note there is one important finding that you have to note while you are doing autopsy what is that just now we have discussed about that at the time of death the person is having lot of convulsions so what is getting generated the heat is generated in the body so after death what are you supposed to look for you need to look for what is called as post mortem caloricity we just now discussed about it remember here also you can see the phenomenon of post mortem caloricity right because it is excessively generated fine a farmer was sleeping on the field he felt a sting on his leg he saw something that was moving away he then got drowsy was taken to the hospital he had pain around the site and he had continuous profuse bleeding continuous profuse bleeding spontaneous bleeding what is that bite is it a viper bite cobra bite wasp bite and scorpion bite remember it cannot be a scorpion bite because one of the most important feature of this scorpion bite is where the person scorpion sting is where the person will get autonomic storm right see the venom of scorpion is very similar to cobra venom but the fatality is less that is because the amount of venom the quantity of the venom that is injected is less right here you can see autonomic storm right the patient can present with uh, cholinergic features anticholinergic features all these features will be there right for it, it basically the autonomic storm it is due to the sudden excessive uncontrolled release of catecholamines into the circulation okay excessive release of catecholamines into the circulation the person can land up with autonomic storm it can be fatal but remember one of the most characteristic feature of scorpion is pain that is a most common feature and then autonomic storm can be there right and so the treatment option for this scorpion sting would be first to pain relief to relieve the pain right we can give local uh, infiltration of lignocaine or sometimes we can also give a systemic uh, uh, analgesics but autonomic storm we have to give an alpha blocker that is prasocin right but here there is no uh, there is no prominent bleeding profuse bleeding from the side so that is not possible cobra wasp again is not possible cobra cobra is predominantly it's a neurotoxic snake right cobra belongs to elapid you know most of the venom predominantly they are neurotoxic the person should be presenting with neuromuscular failure right paralysis of the muscle so that is also ruled out a viper is the best choice let us look at the features of viper bite or oh, in turn like we'll discuss about ophitoxemia in general let's talk about snake bite ophitoxemia right the patient can present with local symptoms right wherein the patient can have pain locally the patient can have swelling the patient can have blisters the patient can have necrosis the patient can have infection gangrene right and regional lymphadenopathy can also be there all these features right they are more seen with viper right intense local necrosis is a typical feature of viper bite and do remember this is called as painful progressive swelling this is called as painful progressive swelling which is very typical for viper bite very very typical fine and uh, you see local symptoms there is something called occult bite where crate you don't see any kind of features at all there sometimes you can't even see the fang mark occult bite and then let us talk about neurotoxicity elapids neurotoxic envenomation neurotoxic envenomation you know that is elapid cobra crate common cobra king cobra or all these snakes
वेर इन द पेशेंट विल प्रसेंट विथ टिपिकली डिसेंडिंग पैरालिसिस राइट पेशेंट इनिशियली विल हैव ड्रूपिंग ऑफ आईलेट्स डिप्लोपिया राइट डिजार्थ्रिया patient will have slurring of speech as well gradually the paralysis we keep on coming neck flexor paralysis the patient will be having breathing difficulty dyspnea finally resulting in death due to respiratory failure you can find out the typical descending paralysis right paralysis of the muscle in neurotoxic snake particularly cobra and crate that belongs to elapid family right and coming to viper right hemotoxic hemotoxic envenomation seen with viper right and the common vipers russell's viper and saw scale vipers nowadays hump nose viper bite is also very common but saw scale viper and russell viper is quite very common wherein one of the most dreadful combination the patient can land up with dac disseminator intravascular coagulation wherein the patient can go for this spontaneous bleeding right patient can present with spontaneous bleeding the patient can present with epistaxis melina hematemesis hematuria everything will be there not only that the patient can also land up with renal failure right that's a part of disseminated intravascular coagulation so that is so typical of this viper bite viper bite so you can see that the if you look at the incidence of uh, spontaneous bleeding is more commonly seen with viper bite right fine so the answer should be viper bite i have just taken few pictures of the snakes again many a times you get image based questions on the uh, this particular topic snake bite cases sometimes they can ask you like this patient has bitten by a snake and he has brought the snake or the, the relative showed uh, the picture of the identified the uh, snake with the photograph or the image right what is the probable uh, toxicity the patient can land up with and what is antidote something like that they can ask you starting with the identification of the snake right the identification of snake becomes very important right you get lot of lot of questions from this particularly with regard to inict examination right you have few months for inict examination people who are appearing for inict examination do make a list of all the common topic that has been asked in inict keep on revising it again and again go in depth for the particular topics definitely the questions will be focused around the same topics right with regard to examination of uh, survivor in a case of sexual assault examination of accused in a case of sexual assault right autopsy techniques very commonly asked consent the negligence cases ethics these are all the areas where is frequently targeted in your inct so you need to take the list keep on hitting it again and again and again okay now let's see this is the king cobra this is uh, ophiophagus anna you know it belongs to elapid so it has to be neurotoxic this is common cobra look at the spectacle mark so this common cobra very small snake maybe it can grow up to 1 meter only again it is neurotoxic this is crate remember it can cause occult bite that is important it can cause occult bite and this can cause neurotoxicity right occult bite means patient won't even know that there is a, the person is bitten by a snake locally no symptoms will be there not even phagma that's why it is called occult right directly the patient might end up with paralysis fine and you can see this is your russell's viper fine you can see that uh, how can you <laughs> identify russell's viper you can see that there are three rows of diamond shape mark one two on the other side three if this is the snake on the top one two on the sides you can also note that you can see this is attached one mark is attached to the another one russell's viper fine most of the times it is vascular toxic but there will be also be an element of neurotoxicity there but predominantly it is vascular toxic or hemotoxic this is again russell's viper this is saw scale viper right this is saw scale viper you can identify right by the arrow mark on the head and you can also easily identify by the saw like scales in the body of the snake fine this is saw scale viper the scientific name is echnis carinate echnis carinate right and this is dabio russelli dabio russelli fine and your uh, crete it is bungarus ceruleus it produces bungaro toxin ceruleus right this one common cobra is najanaja this is najanaja and your king cobra is ophiophagus anus ophiophagus anna right ophiophagus ophio means snake it eats another snake ophiophagus anna right so these are the scientific names but do remember this common cobra crate russell's viper saw scale viper these are all the big four 
right against which our indian anti snake will be very very effective 314 ipc again this is very important topic right many times you get questions on that particularly if you are appearing for neat or any said questions will be on the abortion legal abortion that is legal abortion that is you might get questions on mtp or you you may get questions on illegal abortion that is criminal abortion what are the section that are associated with criminal abortion fine you just have to remember three sections nothing more than that 312 313 and 314 right criminal abortion legally it is called as voluntary miscarriage voluntary miscarriage done with the consent of the female you can say that is punishable under 312 ipc don't start with 311 right people start with 311 12 13 it's not like that you need to start with 312 312 313 312, and 314 ipc without the consent of the female without the consent of the female that is 313 and 314 is criminal abortion because of complication resulting in death of the female right fine so 12 13 14 with consent without consent and death 315 ipc death of uh, an act causing the death of an unborn child so this is 312 313 and 314 right so let's go forward so answer would uh, be death of a mother while the intent to cause an abortion right abortion resulting in death abortion of unborn child ranging to culpable homicide this is given by 316 ipc right 316 fine 316 the baby is born and the baby was killed right you call it as infanticide right it is punishable under dash section is it 316 ipc or is it punishable under 302 ipc 302 is a ipc that is meant for murder right so which section punishes right infanticide do remember in india make a note of it in india there is no differentiation between a killing of an adult and killing of an infant infanticide is always punishable under 302 here it specifically means that 316 ip specifically states that it is an act causing death of an unborn child if it is born then it is murder unborn child it is punishable under 316 ipc in opc poisoning patient treatment was done with atropine and pralidoxime right fine the patient has become hypothermic fine this is due to dash it's very simple it is atropine we know that it is anticholinergic right there was another question which we got in dathura there you can see that the child ate the fruit the child developed high fever right even if you have not read about this topic no problem if you have particularly if you have concentrated on that particular question you could have answered here correctly right there the poison was dathura they have mentioned the patient was presenting with high fever photophobia confusion and decreased salivation they have mentioned high fever as a symptom there that the same thing has been asked in different version in this particular question the answer would easily be atrophin toxicity right it is not cyanosis it is not aspiration pneumonia it is not oxime toxicity right it is atrophin toxicity straightforward simple question very easy question a worker working in hot weather condition in the field collapsed with altered consciousness the patient was brought to the hospital his temperature was recorded to be 106 degree fahrenheit i don't know in this session like uh, many of our questions were related to temperature fever temperature post mortem calorosity again the temperature was mentioned 39 degrees celsius okay which of the following is least expected tachycardia hypotension hot skin and sweating right so we we'll have to find out what condition is first of all what is mentioned here the first the patient has got uh, altered consciousness number 1 the patient was working in hot weather conditions number 2 and uh, you can see the temperature body temperature is increased to 106 degree fahrenheit that is 3 they gave you the the complete hint the complete clue was given this condition is basically called heat stroke right this is called heat stroke heat stroke has got the classical triad right you must have known the classical triad if there is any history of heat exposure which is associated with cns dysfunction cns symptoms which is associated with uh, body core temperature increased more than 40.5 degrees celsius this is the triad of heat stroke the classical heat stroke the diagnosis is done it is a case of heat stroke very simple and straightforward but which of the following is least expected tachycardia hypotension heart hot skin sweating see this is a condition of classical heat stroke remember it is a condition of classical heat stroke we also have one more that is called exertion heat stroke for discussion purpose let's take only the classical heat stroke wherein the patient will be having uh, increased heart rate tachycardia 
the patient will be having hypotension the patient will present with uh, hot and dry skin do remember sweating sweating will be completely absent in a classical heat stroke pupils will be constricted fine so these are all the typical features clinical features of the classical heat stroke that you have to notice elderly person more prone for this kind of classical heat stroke again they did not mention elderly fine they just mentioned worker they didn't mention about the age fine you can see heart rate is increased heart skin is there bp is reduced sweating is absent tachycardia that is correct hypotension that is correct heart skin that is correct sweating is least expected in this condition again this is not a new question if this is the question asked last year in your inact examination remember the same question has been asked in different they have just done paraphrasing and they have just asked the same question that is the importance of your previous going through the previous year questions and the previous year topics fine so the answer is sweating and again here do remember if the patient dies if the patient dies what do you see during autopsy remember you have to look for post mortem caloricity right impaired heat regulation at the time of death after death you can see post mortem caloricity i told you know the person has taken one particular post mortem caloricity the temperature from that he has gone into cystine poisoning he has also asked question about heat stroke okay fine now going forward a chronic alcoholic uh, presents with confusion mental confusion loss of uh, muscle coordination abnormal high movements double vision what is this condition this is one of your e easily so this is a condition which is seen with alcohol related syndromes the answer is your vernix encephalopathy right so this is not run a mock Ranomog is normally that you get in cannabis, wherein the patient will be having a typical homicidal rage. He becomes so violent. He has got homicidal impulse. So that that is not so typical here. Delirium tremens. There is no mention about the altered sensorium. There is no mention about hallucination and uh, tremors, and there is no history of alcoholic withdrawal. Nothing is given. So the answer is typically goes either a psychosis or encephalopathy. The condition which is the symptom which is typically given, right? Wherein the patient has given global confusion. The patient has got confusion. The patient has got ophthalmoplegia, ophthalmoplegia, and he has got ataxia. right so he has got typical goa when it has got when he has got typical goa then it has to be vernix encephalopathy it is uh, you can see the thiamine deficiency thiamine deficiency can be noted fine so this answer is again this is again repeat question this is not a new question as multiple times in your examination the treatment modality in a case of aspirin poisoning normally they used to ask paracetamol this time they have asked aspirin poisoning with 100 tablets right Uh, which antidote that you would like to give for the patient? In every exam, you get at least one or two questions from antidote. In every session, you can take it from me that you will get at least one or two questions from antidote. Enlistel cysteine, we give it for paracetamol, right? Gastric lavage, right? If we have got better antidote, we can think of the flumazenil given for benzodiazepine. Remember here, the person has got aspirin poisoning, wherein we have to do urinary alkalinization. Urinary alkalinization because aspirin is an acidic drug if you want to give if you want to increase the excretion of the acidic drug remember we have to do alkalinization of urine by giving sodium bicarbonate so that is the best that is the best choice that we can choose here okay fine right gastric lavage can also be done because he has come with 100 tubs obviously we have to do gastric lavage but better than that i would choose b option rather than choosing c because b is more appropriate fine so i still alkaline diuresis by giving sodium bicarbonate a 10 year old male said came to the casualty with difficulty in walking had pain in the perianal region anal swabs were taken showed needle shaped crystals with the picric acid okay there are two clues number 1 the needle shaped crystals fine they have given needle shaped crystals and they have given another important uh, clue that it is about perianal region anal swab right so it must be a seminal stain right so we have to think in terms of test for seminal stains right fine needle shaped crystals with picric acid what is this test this test is basically what is this test this test is basically your barbirio's test barbirio's test 
wherein we look for the presence of needle shaped crystals which is typically yellowish right yellow color needle crystals this is one area again it is being continuously targeted for the last i think two years multiple sessions you got this question beat nict beat neat pg or fmg exam every exam you tend to get questions either on barbarios test or in the takayama test blood stain uh, in the blood stain you will get takayama if it is a seminal stain you will definitely question get question on barbarios remember you need to go in depth first thing in barbarios test we are looking for the presence of spermine in the semen spermine and uh, if you give the barbarios reagent it forms what is called as spermine picrate since it is spermine picrate you get yellow color needle crystal that you can notice that you can observe that in the microscope you can see barbarios test is specifically given over there remaining tests are not there florence test is where we get your dark brown rhombic crystals dark brown rhombic crystals which is basically choline iodide acid phosphatase test can also be given but acid phosphatase test is not that something that you see with the microscope this is an enzymatic test as a prostatic acid phosphatase prostatic acid phosphatase suppose if you are uh, able to see more than 100 bodonsky units right that suggests that the emission happened less than 12 hours recent activity but that is enzymatic that is not uh, associated with the the crystals right crystals you just have to remember only two things number one barbarios number two it is florence barbarios is where you get yellow needle and florence is something where you get dark brown rhombic crystals which is very very simple but let me tell you another important point in this question let us take one more extra point you can see 10 year old male child you can see what is this condition a 10 year old male child is subjected to sodomy right 10 year old male child subjected to sodomy this person is a passive agent right passive agent right if the active agent happens to be adult this passive agent happens to be child this condition this condition is called as pederasty remember it is called as pederasty and this fellow this 10 year old child will be called as ketamite accused will be called as pederast the condition is called as pederasty and it is called as ketamite do remember it can also be asked in the future exams you can see this is the seminal stain where you can see starchy appearance you can see uh, irregular in outline you can see this appearance of this and if you see through uh, uv light you can see the fluorescence but that is not specific because you can see the fluorescence even in uh, nasal secretions and the vaginal secretions you can see that one thing they can ask you is what is the reason for this fluorescent activity that is due to the presence of choline and what is the color that you get you get bluish white you get bluish white okay so that is important fine what are the two important tests that we can do microchemical test number one it is barbarios test this is the appearance of barbarios test yellow needle crystals right another one is florence test where we, wherein we get your dark brown rhombic test this is florence test and what are we checking in Florence test? We are checking choline, whereas Barbarios test, we are checking spermine. I told you that. And which is the gold standard for the seminal stain test? The gold standard for the seminal test is this, wherein you need to do microscopy. If you are able to do, if you are able to find out one complete intact spermatozoa, that confirms it is a seminal stain. That's it. That is a gold standard. Okay. So we have discussed all the questions right i hope that uh, you're able to get clarity on the questions and uh, i want you to just uh, take out the list of uh, important topics asked in the previous inact examinations if you're appearing for next inact examination make sure that you take the previous year topics and make sure that you just have a complete reading in-depth reading so that you'll be ready for the examination okay all the very best take care